Hello, and welcome to DDCI's first ever podcast. My name is Evan O'Reilly, and today we'll be talking about a place, about a country, that we don't hear very often, Ecuador. For a country about the size of New Zealand, nestled between the Pacific Coast and the Andes Mountains in South America, Ecuador has made a huge impact on debt and development around the globe. First off, we'll join our director, Maeve Bateman, at the UNCTAD 14, a UN conference that took place last summer in Nairobi, Kenya. There, Maeve had the chance to speak to Vladimir Soria from Jubileo 2000 in Ecuador, a civil society organization campaigning for debt relief and reforms to the financial system. We'll learn about the history of Ecuador's debt crisis, the outcome of its default, and the issues facing it today on the cusp of its elections. We'll start by asking Vladimir to tell us about the background that led up to Jubileo being founded. Jubilee was founded in 1999. Those years were difficult for Ecuador society because we had a financial crisis. Uh, more than 10 banks were bankrupt. Our currency was having an accelerated devaluation. It was getting almost an hyperinflation too. So it was a higher employment. The people that had no opportunities in the country had to go to other countries, especially Spain, Italy, in, in Europe, and in the United States too. So these conditions were what motivated and molded Jubileo. Much like in our own country, the IMF pressured Ecuador into saving the financial system and implementing harsh austerity policies. These, of course, had devastating impacts on ordinary Ecuadorians, as Maeve finds out. How did the structural adjustment policies impact on the lives of ordinary people? In many ways, it was easy to fire people. It increased a lot of unemployment. The liberalization of the financial market also uh, made to almost no regulation in Ecuador. Besides, uh, the central bank did high credit to the banking that anyway they they went to bankrupt. I mean, it was not effective, the, the loans from the central bank to the banking. But with so much of the country's resources going to repaying debt, social policies were slashed, leading to a doubling of the poverty rate. Vital services like health, education and pensions were in danger of privatization, which would have meant that huge swathes of the population would be left without any support. But still, things got even worse. But among everything, what especially affected people is that when the banking system, I mean more than 10 banks, went to bankruptcy, the government decided a banking congelation of the deposits. I'm going to jump in here to explain that in Spanish, congelar means to freeze. So what happened was the government froze bank deposits. People could not take their own money from the banks for around uh, one and a half year, more than a year. So if you know that you have saved your money and you cannot take your own money, and they give you papers that you have to change in the financial market but with a a huge discount, with 40% discount, the people, they say, hey, it's my money. Why do I have to have a discount to have a liquidity for my money? What Vladimir is describing here was a result of an emergency decree by the government in 1999, freezing bank accounts for a year. The situation for Ecuadorians was bleak. Price of petrol surged by 170% and inflation was the highest in Latin America. Throughout 1999, Ecuador's currency, the Sucre, lost 67% of its foreign exchange value. Then in one week, at the start of 2000, it lost a further 17%. On January 9th, the president, Jamil Mawad, announced that the US dollar will be adopted as Ecuador's official currency. This hasn't changed, even today. In the markets in Quito or Guayaquil, vendors still deal exclusively with regular old US dollars, although at least their coins are still native Ecuadorian. This means that the change Ecuadorians get from the supermarket can include the portraits of people like George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, and former president of Ecuador, Eloy Alfaro. To get a better grip on this situation, I decided to Skype with someone I thought might have some practical experience with Ecuadorian affairs. Hi, my name is Chris O'Connell. Uh, I'm a PhD candidate in uh, the School of Law and Government uh, in DCU, uh, and I'm also the chairperson of the Committee of the Latin American Solidarity Center, LASC. Chris is something of an expert in Latin America, particularly Ecuador, where he has spent five years working in higher education. Looking through the Ecuadorian crisis around the millennium, um, yeah. I'm really struck by dollarization in particular, because it just seems like such a drastic step. So how do ordinary Ecuadorians feel about using foreign currency? How does it affect them? Well, the use of the dollar has become accepted now. The 
relative stability of the dollar has come to be sort of uh, held up as a great thing. But at the time, getting rid of the super, which was the, the currency uh, that pre-existed the dollar in Ecuador, uh, was a huge issue. It was strongly resisted by civil society, particularly by the indigenous movement uh, and also by elements of the armed forces. Uh, led in, in that instance by future president, uh, that stage Colonel Lu- Lucio Gutierrez. And there was a, a junta uh, that ousted President Mawad. He was a, an economist who had proposed that measure. The vice president, Gustavo Novoa, took over and, and went ahead with the plan to dollarize anyway. It wasn't just dollarization that caused that. It was all the things that came before that as well. The, the financial crisis and corrupt political elites looking after the the corrupt bankers and look bailing out the system and not protecting citizens and as you can imagine it was it was a huge adjustment uh, for ordinary people particularly coming after a, a level of hyperinflation uh, caused by the the financial crisis psychologically i think it, it was uh, huge and, and practically it presented a lot of difficulties the idea that something could cost one when the day before it had cost you know ten thousand was a, a bizarre concept there weren't enough actual physical currency in the country uh, initially. Notes came came first uh, from the U.S., but uh, Ecuador didn't start minting its own coins. Uh, they didn't go into production right away. So again, then everything cost a dollar. Um, and so when you you know, so people were, you know, kind of packaging uh, together uh, items and saying, "Right, I give you ten for a dollar," uh, because there was no way to give change. So this crisis that Ecuador found itself in the Jubileo is now entering was having real and unusual social and political effects. Jubileo focused on the fact that despite the crisis facing people at home, there is still pressure to pay external debts, debts that they did not think were entirely legitimate. Vladimir can tell us more about who accrued these debts and why he thought the people should not have to pay. From 1999 to 2005, our main focus was on external debt, and especially the renegotiation, because Ecuadorian debt began in the dictatorship from 1976 to 1979, then uh, in democracy 1979 to 1982, uh, it was the first stage. I call it the dictatorship external debt. Then in 1982 to 1988, more or less, is the second stage that we call it sucretization because it was a translation of private external debt to the state. Basically, our elites, Ecuadorian elites, hired external private debt in dollars, but then they decided that they didn't have enough dollars to pay, so they translated the currency risk to the state. So they pay it in sucres, in the local money, and the state covered the currency differential. So, the issues that Vladimir brings up here are basically that Ecuador's former military dictatorship started this debt snowball rolling. Then, much like in Ireland, the Ecuadorian state took on private debts when the elites gambled and lost. In the late 90s, however, Ecuador had the chance to renegotiate its debts under what was called the Brady Bond System. Then it became the Brady renegotiation in the 1990s. That was a, a bad business for a government because capital and interest were negotiated at the nominal price, but at the market it was around 20 cents. The market was paying for our debt, so it was obviously to negotiate something from the 20% to the 100%. That's the point of negotiation, right? But they negotiated at the 100%. In that negotiation, the creditors had different information with the minister or the central bank. Well, I have paid this, 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 and this. The creditors say no, all records are the ones that are valid. Your information is not valid. So it was incorporated some debt that actually we do not have evidence that it existed. Brady bonds, or US dollar bonds, first issued in 1989 and named after then US Treasury Secretary Nicholas Brady. Brady bonds were a way of converting traditional bank loans, which are mostly static, into more mobile bonds that could be traded, a step that allowed banks to get these debts off their balance sheets. These Brady bonds were not only used in Ecuador, they were employed all over Latin America, and to a lesser extent in Africa, Asia, and Europe. But this renegotiation was a particularly sore spot for Jubileo, as Vladimir notes. The Brady's renegotiation was illegal 
was unconstitutional, it was illegitimate, but uh, in those times it was a neoliberal government. And the funny thing is that all the functionaries of those governments, I right now in the IMF, World Bank, Inter American Development Bank, they are IFI functionaries. So it was a platform. Okay, you did a good job negotiating for the financial international interest. So you, this is your prize. You have a good position in our institution. This Brady renunciation implied to accept some structural adjustment policies. One of those is the liberalization of the financial market. And that is the beginning of our financial crisis of 1999 that I, I just told you. So, after this ineffective renegotiation, Ecuador became the first country to default on its Brady bonds in 1999. And a year later, in 2000, their debt was restructured. All are the stages that were covered by the audit in 2008 was done by the government of Rafael Correa. Jubileo was doing research of all these previous stages, so that was our main focus from 1999 to 2005. And later, when one of our members, uh, Ricardo Patiño, was the finance minister of our current president, Rafael Correa, he decided to put this important research that had been done in Jubileo 2000 into public policy. So he asked the president to do audit of the external debt. It was done. And the results showed that the renegotiation was done not in favor of Ecuadorian interests, but against it. I'd like to hit pause here for a second because I'm not sure Vladimir's modesty captures how monumental a result this was. For the first time, a country had put an independent citizen's audit of their sovereign debt into practice and had found almost $4 billion of it to be illegitimate. It was a fairly historic uh, event. Uh, to carry out a debt audit and historic event for a country that, by its own admission, could afford to pay its debts, questioning those and ultimately uh, defaulting uh, on those debts uh, on what they claim were, were moral reasons due to the illegitimacy and the illegality uh, of the debts that had been incurred. Chris is right. It was a historic moment, and one that had been long in the making. That had been a huge issue in, in Ecuadorian politics going back over a long time, particularly Lucio Gutierrez, who I mentioned a little while ago, who was involved in the in the ouster of Jamil Mawad. He then ran for president in 2002 and was elected with the support of the indigenous movement on the basis that he was going to uh, pay the social debt. Uh, and uh, and this is something that he, he didn't do. He made various noises, but he continued to pay the uh, external and internal creditors over um, uh, investing more in, in social services. This concept of paying the social debt was an important one in Ecuador. The basic idea is that governments owe a social debt to their citizens, which they pay through investing in health, education, pensions and so on, allowing the people to reach their full potential. It's a very poetic idea, and one that we could definitely use here in Ireland. But much like the audit itself, it took a while to get off the ground. In 2005, President Lucio Gutierrez was deposed, following a week of protest by frustrated citizens and replaced by his vice president, Alfredo Palacio. And while Palacio tried to set up his audit, he was vilified in the international press for doing so. It was only in 2006, when Palacio's economics minister, Rafael Correa, successfully ran for president, that the audit really began to take shape. And, as Chris notes, He was also backed in his team of supporters by people like Alberto Acosta and Ricardo Patino, who had been involved in the Jubilee movement. So Jubilee was doing well under the new political climate, but Correa's so-called citizens' revolution, a sweeping social, economic and political plan to reinvigorate Ecuador, benefited from the audit as well. Uh, it bought a lot of legitimacy. It fed into that idea that this is a government that honours its promises. And not only was this audit hugely influential within Ecuador, it was very internationally minded. There was already an international network, so people from Belgium, Argentina, Brazil, from many other countries, help us to do the audit. We had a special help from CADTM, Eric Toussaint, from a Peruvian researcher, Oscar Ugarteche, from uh, an Argentina lawyer, Alejandro Olmos Gaona, and Brazilian Maria Lucia Fatorelli. They all, along with Hugo Arias from Jubileo, did a great job. They did such a great job, in fact, that other citizens' audits sprang up all around the world in Brazil, in the Philippines, and even here in Ireland. But while it was welcomed by the public, for the financial elites, the audits seemed dangerous. I mean, it was an unpopular for businessmen. 
for bankers too because they are the holders of the external debt. And since uh, it liberalized resources for not paying external debt, it was popular for the population. I mean, since you do not have external debt bonds, it's not a bad thing for you. And if you are benefited by the social policy, it is good for you. So it was a good hit. But there is a lot of regulation. So if now banks have bankruptcy, bankers pay. It's uh, the more important regulation change. Because previously there was bankruptcy, the state assumed the bankruptcy. But right now, if banks go bankruptcy, they assume the losses. So the changes that took place turned the tables in a way. After decades of benefiting elites, maybe even centuries depending on how you view things, Ecuadorian economics had finally begun to work for the poorest. But Vladimir does not necessarily think that this process would work for everybody. Would you recommend the debt audit process to other countries in a similar situation? Do you think it's been positive for Ecuador? Sure, because the work was technically well done, but I'm not sure if it would be that effective as it was in Ecuador, because since Ecuador was the first one to do it, it was a surprise effect. So it allowed a market resolution, even though it caused an elevation of the country risk. However, the elevation of the country risk is a reality, whether we renegotiate it or not. And in spite of these undeniable successes, the audit has also drawn some criticism. Some of it deserved, some of it outright conspiratorial. For the financial system, which is growing more and more worried that other countries might follow suit, some of the terms it used were problematic. Much of the debts Ecuador had now declared to be illegitimate could just as easily apply to other countries, with the potential to wipe trillions of dollars off the slate in one go. And the government wasn't doing itself any favors. About a year before the audit was published, this happened. Cuatro meses de trabajo como asesor de política del Ministerio de Economía terminaron abruptamente. Pero según él, habría otros motivos para su salida del gobierno. Un registro de audio y video al que Pasmiño tuvo acceso. Ricardo Patiño, one of the Jubileo team and then economics minister, was caught on tape with a New York investor threatening to, quote, scare the markets in order to drive down the market value of the Ecuadorian bonds. When the scandal emerged, accusations began flying that Patino, Correa, or even, bizarrely, Venezuela were trying to profit off the audit. But one of the more lasting criticisms is that Ecuador would lock itself out from foreign investment. And with its New Deal-style social spending financing the citizens' revolution, a fall in oil prices, and good old-fashioned corruption, its debt has been steadily increasing. With nowhere left to turn, Ecuador went to one of the biggest, newest lenders on the scene, China. After Ecuador did this default, the only financial resources we had was the bilateral credits from China. So our indebted rate that was below 15% of GDP has increased to around 35% GDP, has doubled in relative terms. There have been good changes, for example, in infrastructure that have been financed by public sector. I mean, the state fixed all the highways, the roads, and also when it was set up that the high school and university education is also free, it has increased the rate of population studying. Well, at least Ecuador did it with the bilateral credit, so it is not private involved, it's not a public-private partnership, it's public-public partnership, it's South-South, no? because it's China. Vladimir takes a positive view of China's involvement in Ecuador. At last, they are no longer dealing with the Global North, but are instead turning to the Global South, but these dealings have also attracted a lot of controversy. Initially, was you know quite they were quite cautious about it. Even some criticisms by Korea about dealing with China was worse than dealing with the IMF. But slowly, that that whole rhetoric has changed, uh, and uh, and that China is has been has been floating the boat for a number of years now. But the question really that a lot of people are asking is at what price? It's it's very very difficult to get a clear sense of what the level of debt to China is, uh, and the government is not transparent in this regard. And a lot of people are speculating that these are kind of short-term loans on, on quite high interest. At the same time, the government itself made, made strong noises about not wanting to be borrowing from the IMF, not wanting to borrow from the World Bank, and sort of put itself out of the market. So it didn't really have a huge amount of choice. But the other question has been with regard to natural resources of Ecuador, particularly oil, but, but not only oil. In 2009, a deal was signed, and that was the start of their dealings with China. 
And since then, the amount of oil going in Chinese hands is huge. The Chinese uh, have have control of Ecuador. And for, for a government that set its stall out as, as sovereignty, uh, and it has maintained in the main sovereignty from uh, North America and the global north, but it's certainly, you know, given away a, a quite a significant portion of sovereignty there. And that's not something that they think about very much. These criticisms, especially around natural resources, are galvanizing the Ecuadorian opposition. While Correa and his government had always faced criticism from elites, for the financial sector and from right-wing politics, he's beginning to lose some favor among the left. And with an election coming up in a few days, in which Correa hopes to be succeeded by former Vice President Lenin Moreno, these divisions are becoming more and more important. Vladimir can give us the inside scoop. Right now, politically, the president has an increasing opposition. Many people that was with him in the previous years nowadays are against. He has had good policies, but he has also supported controversial proposals. No? It is a confusing interpretation of Ecuadorian framework because from one side we are promoting the social solidarity economy, the economy of the people of near the poverty in order to improve the quality of life. But on the other hand, there is also a law that make important concessions to the foreign direct investment. So you have to balance from many sectors. So social solidarity from one side, but by the other side you have PPP. From one side you have Yasuni, protection of the Amazon, and by the other hand you have extractivist policy that is asking to come the mining. That name, Yasuni, has a very particular relevance in Ecuador. Yasuni is a national park and is arguably the world's most biodiverse area. In fact, one hectare of land there contains more tree species on average than the entirety of North America, and a single one of those trees can hold more insect species than the entire United States. Unfortunately, in addition to jaguars, birds, bats, and two uncontacted tribes, it is also home to about 20% of Ecuador's oil reserves. In a completely unprecedented initiative in 2007, President Correa pledged to prohibit drilling for oil within the park, provided that the international community donate $3.6 billion to compensate for the loss of oil revenue. The Guardian called his plan the most radical and most forward-looking initiative yet. It was hailed by the international community, Washington, and even Hollywood, joined the admiration of people like Leonardo DiCaprio, Edward Norton, Al Gore, and... Me, Jared Leto, and I just want to encourage anybody who's watching this uh, to give some thought into the Yasuni forest. Six years later, however, the project was scrapped. Altogether, the international community had donated a paltry 13 million. Now, to Korea's supporters, this is a sign of how foreign powers have let the global south down yet again. To the growing opposition within the Ecuadorian left, however, Yasuni is shorthand for a government that has begun to drift slowly but surely away from indigenous and environmental rights. But certainly now you know, we're in a new phase of socio-environmental conflicts, in particularly in the Amazon region of Ecuador, but also in the highland regions. Just recently there was a, a big conflict in the Cordillero del Condor, which is about mining with the Shuar indigenous people. Uh, resisting a Chinese uh, mining company who were moving in there and uh, there was violence, a policeman was killed uh, and as a result of that the area has been militarized and there have been allegations of repression. But it's a very conflictive situation at the moment between the government that for whatever reason is determined to, to continue down the extractivist route. My own view would be that it's mainly electoral considerations that drive that but they're certainly heavily indebted to China and that's part of the, the picture uh, as well. With this mixed outlook on Ecuadorian politics, it can be hard to tell what the future holds for this Andean nation, but if recent events are any indication, it will continue making waves in the world of economic and social justice for years to come. To close, I'd like to play you a clip of Foreign Minister Guillaume Long, speaking before the United Nations in September, calling for a definitive end to tax havens, human rights abuses by multinational corporations, and crimes against the natural world. Pero para poner fin a los paraísos fiscales. But in order to end tax havens, to have vital and urgent resources for our development, there has to be a political fight. It's all well and good for some countries to promise cooperation and development, but it is still just a drop of help in an ocean of injustices, including financial, banking and tax practices, that undermine our right to development. We are proud to be able to present our ethical pact to the world, hoping that it may be an example of a struggle for all people 
against global plutocracy, speculative capitalism, and that capital with no face, no name, no morals, no ethics, that hides in order to dodge its responsibilities. Special thanks to our guests Vladimir Suri and Chris O'Connell for the time and expertise, to Kevin McLeod for the use of his music, and to you for listening. If you'd like to hear more like this from DPCI, please subscribe to our podcasts on Podomatic, iTunes, SoundCloud, YouTube, and on our website. And follow us on Twitter and Facebook for more updates. This is produced with the help of DPCI director, Mae Bateman, writing, editing, and mixing by yours truly, Evan Riley. Be sure to join us next time when we'll be looking closer into the links between finance and the environment. See you then.